Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Nick Ponte. I'm joined as always with my co-host Stephen Clark. How are you doing, Stephen? Brilliant, Nick. Again, we're going to have to go and let Darren go over his introduction story because we've just fucked up and not pressed record. So, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did indeed. We're delighted to introduce Darren Green. Uh, Darren's a property investor and also does uh, property coaching development coaching as well so delighted to have you on Darren how are you yeah I'm really well thanks guys it's good to be here we'll get there eventually and sorry to have to get you to do this again but if you could just give us a little introduction and background uh, of how you got into property we should say as well sorry Gillian Green who is your other half was on the Scottish Property Podcast back in episode 21 so we do know a little bit about you, but we want to get right into it today. You're going to give us some five key learnings about what you've learned over the past years that you've been involved in property, how to advance yourself in mindset and development and stuff like that. So we'll get into all that good stuff later, but tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do in property. Yeah, so, um, and I'll keep it brief because I know those of you who have heard Jill's background are very, very similar. Our reasons to get into property go back to when our um, daughter was born in 2016. Um, and up until that point, we'd been working corporate jobs. So I've been working in my corporate job for about 18 years. Uh, and I actually left about six uh, weeks ago. But four years ago, we started out on this journey to say, basically to sack the nine to five. It was actually more eight to eight. We were working 50, 60 hour weeks. And when we became parents, I just recognized like I'm giving way too much of myself to uh, the company. Although I enjoyed the job and I don't have any, I met a lot of great people there. It was just given, I was given too much of myself and I wanted to give more to my family. So we kind of traded a lot of the, you know, we had a nice house, nice car, you know, a couple of holidays a year. And we just decided that actually we need to be thinking a smarter game, playing a playing a longer game to where we want to be in five years and in 10 years. And so hopefully some of the stuff that I'm going to share today, it's stuff that I genuinely, I'm not just talking about it. This is stuff that I've implemented and helped us get to where we are just now. And similarly, you mentioned there, I work with a lot of um, property investors. I also work with a lot of non people that are not interested in property at all from a transformational coaching perspective. And again, there's some similarities there around the approaches, whether you're interested in property or not, um, that you can hopefully uh, use to your advantage in terms of um, living a more fulfilled or happier life. And I think property has a, has a real, real um, place in, in doing that. So obviously our audience, you know, are property investors. So we're going to try and gear this session towards how, how we can help people who are specifically in the property business. And But a lot of this stuff, like you said, can apply to any walk of life, really. You know, even like relationships, you know, general business, that sort of stuff. But let's just kind of see how we can help people. Uh, you've given me kind of five sort of key things that you have sort of said to me that you feel people kind of struggle with or things that become a bit of an issue. So can we just go through the things just uh, step by step? So we'll just start yeah. off with number one. So you've said here, right from the start, you've got to get clear exactly what you want. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I think back to my 20s, I basically treated life as a bit of a tick box exercise. I, you know, I, I had to go to university because that's what was expected of me had to work hard, get a good job, um, and effectively do the things that society was expecting of me. And I never really stopped until I went into my 30s, I think, to say, what do I want? What do I actually, what do I want out of my life? Where do I want to get to? So uh, when I started asking those questions, you come up with completely different answers. You're either in the wrong job, wrong relationship, and that's certainly what I found. Um, so I changed quite a lot from my 20s going into, into my 30s. But you need to get clear about what you want. So I'm actually, I'm running a, um, a video. I've just recorded a video series on, on setting your goals. And I'm going to be putting that out free on, on YouTube. So if you want, I can, put the, I can put the link in the show notes. But it goes way beyond just setting some goals for yourself in terms of, you know, next year. It's, it's based on a book by Jenny Ditzler um, called Your Best Year Yet. 
but fundamentally it goes through an introspective kind of set of questions that help you understand yourself better, where you come alive, um, what things did, didn't go well, like where did you mess up last year, um, and what can you learn kind of taken into, taken into the year ahead. Uh, and all of it is about starting from what is it that you actually want? So you mentioned um, before, obviously, uh, the audience that will be listening to this are involved in property. That doesn't mean that's your sole focus. Um, we all play multiple roles in our lives, uh, and therefore, it's we need to actually have and respect a balance. Property will be maybe quite a large role in that, but it is only one role the, that we will play. So, so this is like a, a, a kind of a start with the end in mind, Darren, and a reverse engineer the way you see your life at the five-year plan, 10-year plan, whatever you're kind of looking at? Well, that's, it's, a, it's a nice segue, actually, but that's, that's actually my second point, Stephen. I think getting clear about what you want is about kind of who are you? So, like, from a values point of view, like, what, what are you? What do you need in your life to guide you when you start to make big decisions? So, we, people say, like, if you want a job or what do you want out of a relationship? Yeah, well, you need to understand your, Yeah, you, well, you need to understand yourself you know first is it money is it fame is it success is it you know do you need to be in an environment that's fun and you know creative or different you need to come up with that first before you then move into even understanding where do you want to get to how, how do you objectively look at that because some that could be quite a difficult task for people to do is look at yourself honestly in the mirror and, and say kind of who are you and and what motivates you because we all like listening to the fluffy hairy theory bullshit and go yeah i'm doing it for this reason or my family or my legacy but some people do it for different reasons but they can't really admit if you know what i mean yeah well i actually i run an exercise with my clients and again it's a, it's actually a free exercise i put out which is called discover your core personal values because I, I genuinely believe um that without understanding what your core values are, you struggle to be able to make decisions. Once you understand what you want, then you can make the right decisions for your life and you don't need to wait five years, 10 years. You can start doing it right now. So I would say, you know, the exercise takes, you know, five, 10 minutes and there's lots of different ways to do this. But for me, it works and it takes you through a, a list of, a list of questions basically on identifying what have you done in the past? So what, what are the things that you did that worked in the past? When were the things that you feel genuinely proud of in terms of your history? Like what are the th your, your key achievements in life? And then you start to say, well, what were the things that made them achievements? So why do I feel so proud about that? Usually it's overcoming some form of adversity or it was really fun to do, um, or there was a, lots of responsibility on me and I came through it. Putting yourself and taking those learnings into you know, will effectively be driving what your core values are. And therefore, when you think about job opportunities, career development, even property strategies, potentially you want to deploy, you can put them against that and say, do they fit with those values? Um, and you can make much clearer decisions from them. Um, and again, similar to the, uh, the video series that I mentioned, the I've got, a, I've got a free link that I can put in the show notes that I'm 100% sure once your um, your audience actually go through that values exercise, they'll have a much clearer understanding of who they are and what they want. And it's so fundamental as a starting place to get that. I think it's, it's fundamental for all property investors as well, because people just kind of follow the herd a lot and just say, oh, well, so-and-so wants 20 buy a lot of properties. That's what I should do. But not necessarily that like you could have you know, good hospitality skills that might make SA a better fit for you. Or, you know, you might not have the, the, te the temperament to deal with tenants or investors or whatever it, it does suit your personality and what you want in your life what you what you enjoy doing so yeah i can i can completely re relate to that i think it's valuable probably by, be by, valuable for the listeners yeah so this is all about being self-aware right at the start self-awareness isn't it really kind of finding like your values and like you say so is it all right to just want to be rich and make loads of money <laughs> because like quite often you do like Stephen said, you listen to a lot of podcasts, you never really hear anybody saying, I just want to be rich, I just want to be making loads of money. It's all about kind of, you know, I want to do good in the community, I want to put back and I want to provide good homes and I want to leave a legacy. <laughs> so for the people that just want the fancy lifestyle and flash cars, is that okay? So absolutely, like as a, as a transformational coach, and this is where, you know, from a true coaching perspective, you approach it with no, no judgment. 
So if I got clients saying, I want to be rich, like you, you genuinely respect that. I don't have any judgment on that. Now, putting food on the table, being wealthy, they are things which I admire, like personally from, you know, regardless of whether I'm a coach or not. But one thing that I always ask my clients, and it's a question which I never got asked until I was about 34, is what would you be doing when money is no longer an option? And if you let that question land and sit with you for a while, having money is great, but what are you actually going to then do with it? Yeah. So I, I think that's why the, the people are maybe thinking more about what they're what they want to be doing, you know, from an ethical standpoint or giving back to the community or what they can get from their family. There has to be more money is a, a yeah. money is only energy. So it could only facilitate or give you oppor- more opportunity. So that's definitely a good thing. I asked that question because I know obviously there is when you're younger, you know, that is a big thing that plays on your mind and you want to, you know, you're looking at the Instagram lifestyle and that, but obviously as we all know that on this call at the moment, it becomes a point where money's not really as important. Okay. We all want to have a comfortable lifestyle, provide a good quality of life for our kids and our families, et cetera. But like exactly what you said, it then becomes more than the money. Yeah, and you go through different life stages. You know? that as well when you're setting goals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was, I, th- I think when I was 25, what would I be listening to if someone was coming along saying, "What would you do if money was no longer an issue?" Well, I didn't have any at that point, so I couldn't probably even conceive that that was that was um, something I was going to face. But I think being clear, what it, that question allows you to do is consider, well, what would I be doing? You know, if I'm sitting there, 25 years old. If I've got a clear idea of what I would be doing when money had was no option anymore, why am, why could I not start doing that right now? Yeah. So I, I think about where property comes into that. As a as a twenty five year old or twenty something year old investing in property for the long term, not to make a quick buck out of it. We all know that property over the long term is a fantastic vehicle for creating your wealth, but for me, it's been able to create the opportunity for me to spend more time with my kids and my family etc but when you're 25 you might not have family you might not have um you know sorry you might have family but you might not have a a wife or kids or you know responsibility from that perspective that doesn't mean you can't be thinking about where are you going to be when you're 35 and 40 and 45 etc and start just making you know one two three buy to let properties will make a phenomenal difference to your life when you're 35 40 45 so i think it's just recognizing playing a smarter longer game when you're at that age regardless of how you use it you know it could be could be going on holidays or it could be buying a new car but it will give you opportunity over the long term okay so we've got the clarity about exactly what it is we want whether it be you know money or legacy or whatever providing for your family financial freedom you hear all these words popping up step number two how do we decide when there's so many options available to us as somebody who wants to get involved in property? We've got buy to let, we've got serviced accommodation, we've got HMO, we've got all these, you know, obviously in Scotland, we don't really do lease options, but you know, you've got all these different things by renovate refinance. So is this what your point number two is? What strategy, how do we get the kind of, yeah. how, do, how do we transition to I- point number two? Absolutely. So starting with the end in mind. So it's linked to the first one, because without understanding what you want, you can't understand where you want to get to. But it's a real goal setting uh, perspective. So if I think about my own, uh, my own point of view, I never wanted to be hands on with property. So one of the first things that you think about starting with the end in mind, do you want to be the one ripping out kitchens? Do you want to be the one, um, you know, trying to, you know, turn your hand to painting and joinery? Or do you want to leave that with people that actually know what they're wanting to do? If you want to leave it with the people that know what they're doing, you're, you're, it's going to cost you more. So where the, where's that money coming from? You guys have done that quite well. I don't often see you getting stuck in with the manual <laughs> labor. I've got to be said. We, we the, don't, uh... I, I don't. And Jill's way, when my dad comes over and talks about stuff needing done in the house, there's one person he speaks to and it's not me. Um, <laughs> so I, I often joke with Joe, I don't know what end the, the, the screwdriver you're meant to use. And I jest a bit, but I understand the reliance on people finding good quality trades and people that you can trust. But for me, it was never going to be 
our first property taught us that. We had an eight-month-old baby. We got three quotes from new builders, full build team. We had an expectation from our crib sheet of about 12 grand refurb and ended up being 18. And we tried to cut some corners off it and we said, oh, we'll do some painting. That's absolutely fine. And you know what? We're, we're in there with an eight-month-old baby with the windows all open, try to paint this bite of let to try and get our first bite of let. And at that point, you just recognize that's not what we, we're not, we're not doing a good job. You know, it's, it's time that I don't want, I really don't want my eight month old breathing in paint fumes either, but uh, you know, we, we, we should be out at a Blair Drummond Safari Park or, you know, somewhere else doing something. And um, for the cost that that, that was us, I think we went down two or three times to finish that. Um, and it just, it wasn't worth it for the time. Something myself and Stephen are very guilty of getting two hands on the refurbs. I think we've talked about that a lot in the past, yeah. Stephen. Eh? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing to recognise very early on and, and probably rectify it. But like you pointed out as well, the difference between a 12 grand refurb and 18 grand refurb, um, yeah. it's a difference when you, you get your hands dirty a little bit. I don't mind it if it makes the deal work, but yeah, each, each their own. Um, yeah. Like you say, be clear on where that end is and what you want out of it, yeah. So, th so that's definitely one of the questions in terms of starting with the end in mind. Do you want to be hands off? Do you not? The other that I find that I work a lot with is wh where are you going to be investing? Do you want, do you need them to be close to you or are you comfortable, you know, remotely investing? So, um, you know, we've just bought our first unit down in um, Liverpool, our first HMO unit. But hang on a minute, mate. How does this tie in with the strategy? Because we're specifically talking about what it's so many options. People get kind of like, oh, at the start, they get dis disorientated because they don't know which direction to take. So how can we choose which strategy? So I think this is part of it, Nick. So if you, if you, if you don't understand whether, you know, where you're going to be investing, that will actually dictate your strategy. So you mentioned lease options there. Now, I know that there's some exceptions to the rule. Um, I know like Ella and Mohammed who, are, who follow the podcast, they're, they've done some lease options up in Scotland, but that will largely dictate that you would be doing them more south of the border. Similarly, um, if you want to do HMOs, again, there's some HMOs up in Scotland, but for me, I've really struggled to make the numbers work. So that's why we're investing down south. Rent to rent's another one. I, I would say I see far more prevalence of investors down south uh, investing in rent to rent rather than rather than up here, although there are some exceptions. So I think understanding whether you want to be remote investing or whether you want to be uh, have a, a bite of let round the corner, for example, yeah. is actually really important. Some, Do you physically want to see it? Some people will have a problem with that. I know I have a problem with it investing like remotely. Like Stephen is a good example of this. He has found loads of good deals this year in Aberdeen. I was like. I need to get a wee bit of a slice of this Aberdeen action here, right? And then he actually brought me a deal and which looked pretty good deal on paper. It was pretty much get all your money out. And I just couldn't bring myself to move forward to it because it's going somewhere that I don't know. And I'm like, I only want to just, you know, I know Glasgow, I'm within 20 minutes of everything here. I can go and check out all my rentals and stuff like that. Maybe that's what Dharma's referring to in point one about knowing who you are. Maybe you're one of the ones that want to drive... Round, round the streets in Glasgow and go on that, on that, on that, on that. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe. That's interesting. That's interesting. I, I mean, I see that. I see that exact same point now, and I, I, I've seen this exact same trend. In fact, a lot of my clients, like, are, you know, have either bought or are considering buying in Aberdeen, and they aren't in Aberdeen. For me, it doesn't work. You know, personally, because I know that I, I do like, I like having the comfort of something that I can. Um, from a buy to let point of view that I want to be able to see, you know, it's a half hour, 40 minute drive and all our units with the exception of one, which is over in, in, in my, uh, in my home, home County of Fife. Uh, so for obvious, obvious reasons, kind of, kind of keep a hold of that. Cause I've still got family there, but everything else is within kind of 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, but you've just said that you've taken on this one now in Liverpool. So how have you managed to get out of that mindset then? <laughs> So this was a transition knowing that I was going to be leaving my job. I, uh, to give the background to that, I took voluntary redundancy in about April time. So from that point, that I knew that I'd have more time available to be able to invest in another strategy. So we went, 
and this is HMO for us was about how, how can we grow scale quicker? How can we increase cash flow quicker? They were the, the kind of two, the, the fundamentals there. So where would we start doing that? So then we started looking at what areas does it work and doing our due diligence and research in that area. So now investing remotely works for us from a HMO perspective. I would still say buy it let. I wouldn't buy a buy it let in Aberdeen purely because I can probably get one within a half hour drive. And I'd, I'd just rather that personally. It's not for the sake of, um, it's not for anything about Aberdeen as an investment area. It just doesn't work for us in terms of buy to let strategy. Well, this new uh, HMO in Liverpool, though, you're pretty much going to have to start from scratch again because all the team that you've built up here, they are not, I presume they're not going to travel down to, you know, Liverpool to do their EFAB and all that, are they? Yeah. No, no, they're not. It's a brand new build team. It felt like I'd regressed four years going back to that first buy to let where you got, you know, different quotes, different builders around, um, had to go around their uh, properties, seeing different different stages, had they done similar type um, projects, speaking to their investors. So who, who are the people, the testimonials that they're working with? Like 100%, it, it, was, it felt like it was going right back to the very start again. Um, and we'll see. It's early, early days, but uh, I, f- I feel confident in, in, in the build team that I've got. But as you guys will know, I think there's been a couple of things recently that, you know, if things things happen, you need to be making changes. I, yeah. I go, in, go in with the knowledge that I've done as much due diligence as I think I can. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hope for the best outcome, but plan for the worst. Hats off to you, mate, because obviously you've seen the opportunity and you're going for it. So absolutely brilliant. Right, let's uh, let's move it on. Number three, get around the people that are doing the stuff you want to do. This is just really important. I know Stephen, he talks about this a lot. Uh, he's got his mastermind going and uh, it seems to really, really help you. Uh, Dan, do you want to kick us off here? Yeah, I, I, and I think you, what you guys have done for a podcast, can I just say that in itself is getting around the people that are doing stuff. I think you know, when you see the content coming on the community on the Facebook page and through the podcast, you know, these are people that are walking the walking the talk. So like what I would say is on that, ask for help. So I've seen it a few times on your community. It's actually quite, quite welcoming. Um, but even if it, if it costs you, if it costs you a meal, um, I think there was a guy uh, put a cheeky post up a, a few weeks ago uh, saying if someone came around giving my help like stripping wallpaper I'm not not necessarily suggesting that but if there's people there that have got more knowledge than you be humble enough and open enough to go and get around them that poor um, guy that poor guy got pelt he got slated didn't he, he? I, I was <laughs> like I feel bad for him because you know I did exactly the same thing on you know in property and also in my previous work when I was a photographer as well when I was starting out I was like I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think that if you, I think the the it was interesting because the people that seemed to have a problem with it were from a tradesman kind of background, you know, like as if the guy was like just looking for some free labor. And I can understand from their point of view because they don't want to, you know, you know how it is. But it, it wasn't it wasn't that way. It was almost like a kind of com- camaraderie, kind of friendship thing, you know, like I will help you if you help me, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I read it. I thought it came from a came from a good place. And I, to to take your analogy, it's probably a bit like the property equivalent of cleaning the boots when you're a you're an apprentice at the for the football team. Aye. You know, and you're learning from the people that are around you. So, I, I guess it can come in that form, or it can be, uh, or it can be kind of. I know you spoke about from an education point of view. We got around people, although we paid a lot of money. I would never regret paying it because it's got it's got us to where we are now. One of the biggest things that education got us was it got around people that were serious about investing, that couldn't fail, that had to make this work. And therefore, that community sort of three, four years on, the people that we speak to on a daily basis, they're people out there doing stuff and they've dragged us up as they've progressed in their, what they're doing. So get around the people that are doing the things that you're doing, but don't, you know, Go and buy someone lunch or go buy someone a coffee. Pick up the phone and, you know, or reach out on, on Messenger. Don't be shy about it. There's lots of people that will be willing to help you. You've just got to ask the question. I, I like this point. And uh, I held a, a socially distance workshop at the weekend. And it was quite interesting to see people's eyes light up. Now, there's a, there's a handful of people in the room. 
most of them are kind of buying like experience and and they, and they know how to do it, they know how to invest in property. But the minute you were kind of showcasing um, investment strategies and using case studies to show it and and talking real numbers, not just theory based bullshit, it was like here's the private investor, here's how I sourced it, here's how I got off market. You just saw their eyes just light up and the sense of belief that what was possible just kind of opened up to them like wow this is this is what's possible and you, and you knew it just opened their mind space up just by being around people who were actually doing it and talking real real stuff so yeah 100 uh, percent i i get that all day long if you're around people that are doing what you're doing and around, around the people that can drag you up as well yeah i mean I, i'm thinking like, like a year ago when we weren't even investing in hmos it's actually a, a couple that we invest with so we kind of angel invest to, to them through our pension but they offered like come down and see our hmo project you know i'm buying in the same area now but you know walk you around talk you about structuring the deal and they've they've helped me immensely kind of one year on on the, like pull the trigger on a deal um and the other point i wanted to make i did say like if it costs you it costs you but it's it's probably going to be the best roi that you'll ever get mm-hmm. so we started working with a new mentor at the start of this year specifically to get us into the HMO strategy. And, you know, the money that we were paying was effectively what hold our hand, talk us through, walk us through line by line. How do we go and uh, find this HMO deal? And we are looking to go and buy four or five over the next 18 months. We had to spend money to get access to that. But, you know, three months on, we've completed on our first deal. And that confidence to go and then pull the trigger is so, so important. Um, whatever can get you to that point where you can pull the trigger, the, if it costs you a lunch, a paid you know, mentorship or coaching, I genuinely think the return on investment for that, if it's a cash flow and deal that's going to get you into a, strat- a new strategy for you know, 5, 10, 15 years, the return over that time is going to be you know, you know, almost yeah. infinite. A couple of things I want to mention there, right, where I think people really struggle with this is, number one, they're scared of the rejection, right? So they're scared of somebody turn around and says, no, I'm not meeting up with you or something like that, right? It's a mindset they need to get over themselves there because most like, more than likely, people will meet for a coffee. Like, I've not had many rejections and I've reached out to a lot of people. Um, and then if somebody does say no, you're just like, prick move on <laughs> do you know what i mean so it's you, you can't really sleep about that sort of stuff but the other thing that i think uh that, that, that kind of people are a bit kind of scared of is in pro you know they think that it's not property is not really like other business it's not like somebody will message me and say do you want me for a coffee i don't see them as like competition it doesn't seem to be like that in property. Do you know, I think a lot of people are scared in case, or maybe this person will see me as try to compete with them so they won't want to meet up with them. Do you know what I, I mean? Old, I think um, old school mentality, that would be the mentality of old school people that would be like everything closed, keep everything to themselves. But like we know, there's thousands and thousands of deals. There's hundreds of thousands of properties out there that are distressed or empty or need renovated or could be added to a portfolio. So we all know there's enough to go around everyone. Yeah. But I, I think your old school mentality is right. It's that rejection of he don't want to share his knowledge. He won't want to meet for a coffee. Um, but yeah, you're right. And people yeah. feel a bit intimidated as well, especially on sometimes in the Facebook groups. It's a lot you see, we get it on our group. We have so many people who just sit in the background and they don't. They're scared to kind of ask questions because they fear that they're going to be seen as you know somebody who's not doing anything or you know not knowledgeable and that sort of thing. But we always try and uh, encourage people to ask just basic questions because at the end of the day, at least we can answer them if they're basic, Stephen, eh? <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, no, and, and the thing is, I, when you've got a large group of people together, that can be quite intimidating, even in a virtual sense. Like, I think it's really refreshing how both you guys talk about that and kind of you do create that culture in terms of that community. But I think with any large community, you, it can be difficult sometimes to come forward and even you know even within that you know you've got you must be well over a thousand people now um in the facebook group that is you know that's a lot of people there and there's undoubtedly there'll be some people in there that will be the peacocks that need to be showing you know what they're doing and again you can't be in control of what reaction and how people are perceiving that and being intimidated by it or um 
And this is why I'd say I come back to the questions or the, the tips that have came through. There's a logical flow to get past some of that, Nick, where you're going, should I reach out or should I not? They're, you know, they're, I'm intimidated or they won't have time for me. They're too busy. See if you know what you want and you're clear about where you're trying to get to. Mm. Then getting around the right people, the question is, can that person or group of people help me to get to the, get to that place? And if the answer is yes, then you're only asking a question at the end of the day. And I think when you, when you look at things that clearly, you know, asking someone and getting over that intimidation or fear that of rejection for them saying no, it's a little bit easier because yeah. you're confident you're doing it for the right reasons. There was a cracking post from a young boy. I can't remember his name now on the Facebook group. And he was only about 18 or something like that. He came on, great attitude. He says, look, does anybody need any help? A couple of days later, I'll be happy to come strip wallpaper, you know, like in return for just a bit of experience on the job. I thought that is the right, that's the right attitude to to have. Do you know what I mean? Same with me when I um, contact somebody who's, you know, at a high level and I'm thinking, God, that person's like, not going to have time for me. Or if I'm trying to get some information or a meeting with somebody, I'll quite often offer them something in return. So there's something in it for them so it's not just me just take 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 so like i've got skills in photography so i sometimes i say to people in a wee di- direct message i says look any chance i be meeting here i'm needing some help with something in return i will give you some up-to-date headshots for your website do you know what i mean and it's worked for me in the past or i'll come around and do some pictures of your property or something so yeah, I think you're, that's quite important. I suppose you're recognizing someone's time and the value that you can bring gift to them as well. So it's not just a take, take, take. I think people will appreciate that approach as well. Yeah, yeah. and and again, understanding this come back. I come back to that values exercise. Understanding your own value, because sometimes when you're you've got fear of reaching out, it's because you somehow feel you're inferior to to that person. When actually everyone's valuable, right? No, no one's more or less valuable than anyone else. We just perceive it to be more or less valuable because they've got more money or status or class. Well, you know, whatever, you know, bullshit, frankly, we put in our own heads. Mm. Everyone's of equal value. There is no life on this earth that's greater or less valuable than any other. Um, and I think once you go through that and you understand and appreciate your own value, it will help you be able to uh, reach out and ask for that help. Here's an interesting one. You've been through this, both systems, right? You said you spent a lot of money on the education. I know exactly from speaking to Jillian what you guys have been through with the course structure and all that. You've also said you've got a mentor as well. So for somebody who's starting out, who's got, you know, wants to pay for help, what what brings you the most value? Is it that kind of like a seminar course structure or is it a kind of more a kind of one-to-one mentorship thing or does it depend? I, I think it's a bit of a hybrid where I think there's an actual gap in the market and the market's actually moving a lot to this where it's more like membership base and more hands on Stephen's run a couple of workshops, it, you know, it looks like as well. I think, you know, the, the days of tens of thousands of pounds for property training are probably over. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think for the right reasons, we've moved away from that. And I think it's far more hands on. So when I think about some of the, um, clients that um you know both jill and i are working with you're able to go and take them on projects like go and see your Mm. projects speak to the the build team that you've got in place speak to the letting agents the estate agents help them walk them through the process that you actually go and buy deals that's the stuff so i think a lot of the 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 classroom based um strategies and where you can structure a deal is is like absolutely critical but I, i do think like getting out there and seeing it with my own eyes. Yeah. I don't think there's any any better replacements. I think there's almost a hybrid mentorship versus um, kind of theory-based. And if I bring it back to that HMO, I organized a full day. So I paid for a full day with a mentor in, in my investment area. It's just around Liverpool. But we had several sessions up to that. I spent a lot of time desk research you need to get to a point where you're physically there and kind of they gave me the confidence. They didn't set up any viewings. They didn't create any build teams or whatever. I still had to go and put the legwork in, but they're there to give you the confidence to go and pull the trigger, which ultimately there is no deal until you get an offer accepted and you, you kind of complete on it. So 
Um, Stephen will yeah. have a view on that as well. No, I, I, I completely agree. Um, the hands-on kind of, yeah, that's that's going to look at, at deals on, on a theory base. Then, you know, if the property value is at 100 grand, then we've got a 75% loan value mortgage on it. Yeah, there's so many fucking factors around that. The theory quite doesn't quite work. Um, you know, let's find a motivated seller. We all know that, but it's the practicalities of doing this stuff in real life. And like you say, that I think the biggest thing that scares most people off is um, is the renovations and the development aspect of it. So if you can actually take guys on site and and have a look at you know projects and 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 see that it isn't actually that scary once you understand that a bit better, then uh, yeah, I, I completely agree, Darren. And I, 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 and I always kind of respect and how much you and Jillian do pay for. Uh, mentorship and you take huge action and, and get great success from it as well. It's always quite inspiring. I'm the only one that's not actually paid to go on any uh, mentorships or courses, right? But I'm not dead against it. I just haven't found the kind of right thing for me. But, you know, I have been thinking about it a lot lately. And I think if I ever were, you know, if I ever was to kind of take action and get somebody uh, to help me or a mentor or something like that, a, a big part for me would be the accountability thing. Do you know what I mean? So, like, if I had that support and like weekly check-in or monthly check-in, whatever it is they do or how they structure it, I think that would really benefit me. So it's something I've been thinking about. Yeah, and you have I, mentioned I, there I, that you I've do. Got weekly, um, I've got a weekly check-in with my mastermind group and I actually think you're right. It's really important to have, uh, like we only started doing the weekly check-ins when obviously COVID came on and we went in lockdown and I thought rather than meeting up once a month, let's just do a, a weekly Zoom call. And I think it's the best format because in a month you can kind of escape and not do very much and oh I've had a bit of a shitty month if that happens again it's quite a long period of time you can go into a hole but if you're coming week to week on the same call with the same group of guys and you want to make sure you're coming in with a nice win or achieve what you said you're going to achieve the week before and stuff like that um, and and I call them in the bullshit like I, I don't want people on my mastermind group that aren't fucking doing anything like I genuinely do um, I'll, I'll name and shame this guy as well like he was he was talking on the call uh, on Sunday saying that um you know, I I had to give my car to my mate. Um, I've not got the car, blah, blah, But all his Instagram and Facebook posts was um, how he's reached his PB for um, lifting a 200 uh, kilo deadlift. And I was like, oh, how many times have you been in the gym this week? And he's like, oh, yeah, I've managed four sessions. So if you can go to the fucking gym, why can't you go to the viewing room and do it? And I'm like, well, you're not sitting in the mastermind group to give me your pish excuses that your mate's got your car, but you can go to the gym. And then everyone just sitting there like, well, and I'm like, hey, you're paying for this fucking, this mastermind group. You know, you're getting hold of, held accountable. And he just was like, Yep, you're right. 100% right. Um, Tough so yeah. love, mate. Is that some kind of boot camp you're on, is it? Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Again, though, and, and, and I would say, Stephen, that, that there's people that I, like, I I look at yourself and it's like the amount of success that, that, that you've created and the different types of creative, you know, projects that you've done. Um, and similarly, Nick, in terms of, you know, you starting your letting business, I look at those changes from, you know, I first met you, Nick, maybe four years ago when I was just, I, I think I'd bought one property or something when I met you, um, thinking that I knew it all, but knew nothing. Um, and, but I think getting clear on well, wh- wh- that life, like how, where does property fit in there? If you want property to be the big change in your life next year, then go and make that. And like you say, Stephen, it's, you're going to be spending more time, at, less time at the gym you know if that's something you've done because you're going to be invested to get that shift in one area if you want to have a balance of a lot of different things then you need to appreciate you ain't going to, your level of growth in that in property is going to be lower as a result and that's okay there's no judgment of it but you know we need to recognize that like if you put 100 percent effort into something truly 100 percent effort you'll get that you know significant growth if you're going to put 75 in because you're interested your, half your head's turned over here and you're okay with that that's absolutely fine cool we'll I need to push on to the next points yeah. because Stephen's sitting there waiting on his lunch appointment and uh, if you need to shoot mate we understand you know you got to go and tuck you, into your turkey I'm, actually, I'm enjoying this chat <laughs> I'm, right. en- I'm enjoying what? this chat I'm staying put guys I'll just be late for my lunch meetings so the, ne- the next one next efficiency isn't it yeah this is something we, we, we spoke briefly about so there was a couple of points that I think can, can help a lot in here. There's the Pareto principle, which some of you might have heard of, like 80-20 rule. And I think this can be a difficult thing. And it's maybe quite controversial in the sense that you need to find the 20% of stuff that makes 80% of the impact. That, that's effectively it. So um, if you're doing, um, if you're, however you're spending your time in terms of getting results in property, all right, there'll be 20% of the stuff you do in property that will make 80% of the results in your 
whatever strategy you take on. Now, that's unlikely to be the easiest 20%, all right? It's not probably going to be sitting listening to us on a podcast. It's probably not going to be sitting on a Zoom. It's probably not going to be sitting on a webinar. And I say that because that can be easy to do and we can convince ourselves that, well, we're taking action by doing this. But often it's not a lack of education or lack of knowledge. It's a lack of getting out there and doing stuff, getting around the right people. Um, and I mean that with a genuine amount of respect. I think like the, the like your podcast is phenomenal, the content's phenomenal. But I, I don't know if you felt this, but over lockdown, you could have been on a Zoom every single night. Now, if you're working full time and then you're having your dinner, getting on to, to a two hour Zoom call on property, you could be quite happy and feeling relaxed going, oh, I'm, I'm taking real action in my property business. My, I'm building my portfolio. Well, are you? You know, could you be, you know, could you be looking at deals on right move? Could you be meeting another investor for a coffee that's where you want to be and understanding how they structure deals and get together? Could you yeah. be buying someone dinner? So there's, there's only so much education that you can you can oh. absorb information and you do you see that quite a lot actually. The number of times you meet people who are like course junkies and they just go round the system again and again and again. And you see them at sometimes the property networking events and that, and it does happen, eh? Yeah. So I think finding that 20%, and I guess where, where it comes in in terms of that education is it's unlikely to be that 20% is probably, from my experience, is going to be talking to people. So people like you guys, um, talking to estate agents, letting agents in your areas, the people that are in the um, strategies you are wanting to get into that are doing stuff, go and meet them at their projects. Go and see if you can buy them lunch or buy them a coffee, pick their brains. That's the stuff that's probably building relationships is going to be meaningful. We just got a deal accepted um, yesterday's lovely early Christmas present. And that was from a estate agent that Jill met for a coffee about 13 months ago. No real interaction in that time. And I, and I think that's the stuff you're building these pipeline of relationships, properties like no other, you know, or just like every other business. It's a people business. So going f f that 20% is going to be more on the relationships you're building rather than education. Education is going to have a, a bit to it and understanding strategies and how you structure stuff, but it's probably more likely going to be on the conversations and relationship building. The other thing on efficiency is time blocking. So we found this when we bought our first property back in 20, uh, 2017, actually. Um, we had an eight month old, Jill was pregnant. Um, we were getting married in the next month. Uh, we both worked full-time jobs, although Jill was off on maternity at that point. We didn't have a great deal of time that we could we could structure our day. So time blocking, you'll be able to, your, your listeners will be able to find this on, on, on Google, no problem. But effectively, I color code the different stuff I want to do in my life um, based upon getting that right balance of family time and business. But I'll structure it so that, you know, I know what I'm going to be doing every Sunday night, my week ahead's blocked out. And for someone working a full-time job or shift job, that is just looking at your free time and, and making sure that that is, that is focused on the 20% stuff, the stuff that's going to drive the 80% worth of impact, focus on the stuff that's going to be making the difference. Um, and as I said, if you're sitting on five Zoom calls through the week, you probably need to be looking at how you can redistribute that a bit better. It's quite hard to monetize that um, those relationships and those means, though, isn't it? If you're, and I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, it is a people business, and building these relationships are, are what takes your business forward. But it's quite difficult if you're not getting huge results that you look back going, "I'm wasting all this, or I'm wasting all this time. I'm spending all this time having these meetings, having these coffees, building these relationships up, and I'm not seeing the monetary value." But you're 100 right; they do come back in, and later on down the line, like you know, the, the example you gave about Jill with the estate agent 13 months ago, that's now came to fruition where that coffee or that meeting is now paid in the business. I tell you, I'll tell you where I struggle with this, Darren. You'll, you'll maybe laugh at this or you'll know what I'm talking about here, but I've been reading a lot of books lately, right, where they talk about choosing that, you know, that one thing, the bigger task that's yep. going to push you forward, right? So I'm like, ah, that's great. Okay, so I've got, you know, I've got something big that needs to be worked on, the bigger project that's going to help me push forward but 
I get bogged down with just the shit that gets thrown at you day to day and the little wee checklist things that you need to do. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, these wee things are so much easier to do. And I feel like I'm being super productive because I'm ticking off my wee checklist and it's just simple things like pay that contractor. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like send that form here. Because it's easy, I think, oh, I've had a really productive day here. But actually, you're not getting that one bigger project. You're not making any advance there because that's the thing that really needs the kind of mental kind of concentration to sit down and really work on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and if people are different now. I, like, I totally hear that. And you get, generally, you're like an early person or early morning person or you're last thing at night. But all of us will go through different waves at the point of the day where our energy is high and our energy is low. The important thing is to recognize when do you do your best work and see that there's a book called Eat That Frog, which is about just doing the nastiest thing that you know is going to be difficult, but doing that the first thing in the day, because generally your energy levels are high um, and you've got the most motivation to go and attack it and move it on. You may not get it complete, but you'll do it, um, you'll do it a lot better than if you put it at the list the, the end of a whole load of admin lists. Yeah. Um, which is, it sounds like that's what's happening. That's so, I, I mean, in my diary, I only have three things a day that I say I want to get done. And of course, like, there's 101 other things that come in. But if there's three things I choose to do, they'll be the things that I'll focus to get ticked off. The other stuff, sometimes it's, they just have to slide and move. Yeah. And I think it's just being honest that, some things are urgent, so it's not always the things that I choose, but I only focus on doing three things in that day that'll that will make a difference in some way or, or, or another. Um, yeah, and I can I mean, manage to do three things. The time block management was was a huge shift for me, really helpful when I heard about this. And, and it's just basically just as easy as blocking out your diary, isn't it? The Google calendars <laughs> and just like having it written in. You know, it's, it's like the podcast. Myself and Stephen sat down at the start of the year and we were like, right, this has got to be done every week. When are we going to do it? We'll block out our Tuesday mornings. I know we're in the afternoon here now, but we sometimes we make exceptions for special guests. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was blocked in and we have managed to be consistent and get one out every week. So that totally ties into that. Right, moving on to number five. This is our last point and uh, our last kind of takeaway for this session. Uh, Darren, it's yeah. uh, on you go. Oh, so... Um... The last one's kind of multiple, but be kind to yourself, be patient, but most importantly, take action. If there's one thing that I think we spoke about throughout is you need to get out and start doing stuff. Um, a couple of things just to touch on. Comparing yourself to you know any other people is so difficult just now because of social media. Um, and I'm no different. I'm constantly looking at other people, what they're doing on Instagram or Facebook. And... I have to have that self-reflection pull back that actually what they're doing and who they are and what they want is completely different to me. I'm only walking my journey. So again, going back to points one and two, who are you What and where do you want to get to? The level of commitment that you can put into getting there will determine what you're doing and how much action and what you're actually delivering. So I guess the sentiment is there is no value from comparing yourself to other people. Be kind in the sense that We've all got busy lives. We've got multiple, you know, people are coming into it with different experiences. If I look at Mark Stokes, who you had on a few weeks ago, what a phenomenal guy, career that guy had before he moved into property. And we've had the privilege, we had set up our SAS a couple of years ago, but we had the privilege of speaking to, to Mark a bit. And I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't even compare myself. He's talking like 15, 20 million GDVs. There's no value in me comparing myself to Mark because we've walked different paths, we've got different experiences and we want different things. Yeah. Um, so I think just be kind to yourself and try not compare yourself to anyone else because you are unique to you. So just try and be clear about where you're going and consistently you know, take action to get there. So that's probably the main thing I wanted to, to, to get across. Um, the other thing is just that success is, it can be exponential. But it doesn't, you know, people want to come in and start seeing things happen in, you know, the first month or first couple of months. And the reality is things do take time. As Stephen says, you, you have to focus on building the relationships and they will come back. But it's difficult to see that as a return on investment when you're not getting anyone phoning you back. Um, 
and I always remember this Messi, uh, Lionel Messi quote, which is, you know, it took him 17 years or something like that to become an overnight success. No one sees the growth hormone, all the um, struggles, the change of country that he needed to get there to be a world-class player. So I think, you know, exponential success will only ever come after a point of digging in and being consistent over a long period of time. So just be kind with yourself on that journey. Try and not compare yourself to anyone else, but just stay on that path and keep taking action. That's, that's a really good sentiment and a really good point to, to finish up your, uh, your five points on. Uh, I completely agree. You think yeah. That? No, that was brilliant, Darren. Really good stuff there. Um, I, I, I didn't have this down on the... Uh, the, the notes that I gave you or the, the communication that we were going back and forward with. But what about books just while we're on this sort of stuff? Is there any kind of books that you would recommend people get a hold of that really kind of, you know, changed it for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be surprised if anyone's listening to your podcast and not reading things like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's a, that's an <laughs> obvious one. The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson um, is maybe lesser known, but it's, it's very much about compounding effort over a long period of time. Just okay. doing small daily things. Um, really, really transformational book. Um, what else am I reading just now? There's one that I just read about uh, negotiation, and that was brilliant. I Never Split remember. the Difference. Yeah, that was a really good yeah. book. Yeah, um, really good book. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, what are your, um, your kind of mentorship and, and is it that you do, Darren? How does, how does that kind of structure then? So that's structured. I mean, it's a, it's a, we generally it's about a month monthly call. Um, that's about two hours. It's really an open ended session. You kind of done when it's done, but I guess I can only say it's bespoke to us. So we said that this is what we want to get out of it. We want to learn a new strategy. Um, you know, I want to know this from the drains up. I've got, you know, although I've done, we've done some education courses, never in HMO strategy. So we wanted to walk through that and, and take that experience from like a classroom and structure, deal structure point of view. But then I, I wanted to be boots on the ground. For me personally, I needed to be on location looking at projects, you know, understanding um, what type of, you know, properties that worked in. There'll be particular widths and style of houses down in England, which you just don't get up here. Um, so it was understanding all of that stuff uh, physically myself. So we effectively tailored that to say, this is the structure that we want. Um, so I think consistently it's like a monthly, monthly online um, session and, and then face-to-face -face boots on the ground, actually seeing stuff happen uh, when we need it. That's good. Eh? Cool. So do you want to just wrap up? Uh, obviously let people know where's the best place to, uh, do they slide into your DMs or do they email you? <laughs> you I always like hate people? that phrase for some reason. I don't know, slide into DMs. But uh, yeah, so I am on Instagram, Darren underscore green underscore coaching. So you can find me there. I'm um, also on Facebook as well. I've got a, I've got a community that I actually have just started, which is about, it's called Purpose to Progress on Facebook. So you can find me on that. Um, I ran through my HMO deal last week uh, and i'll be mixing it between kind of personal development growth and property um so because i find the two go together if you can leverage property to help you do whatever it is you want to do in life which for me is helping people grow in general um then that's fantastic um because property can be passive and can give you opportunity so yeah welcome um if you if you want to get across there then it would be it would be great to have you Awesome Brilliant. stuff. Well, keep up the good work and uh, it was great to have you on the Scottish Property Podcast. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks guys. Really good. Cheers.